Pretty much everyone I know who knows about such things counts Warren Zevon as one of the good guys. Most people only know him as the guy who's saying about the werewolf, a handful more no things to do in Den when you're dead, or the gorilla song. But very few know the full story of his music, of its bull-headed insistence at telling the story of a guy who did what he did not be damned, who lived his own vision of the American renegade and sought out the dark corners of existence in which to do it. Let's look at his legacy, review it, and rank his albums from worst to the very best. Number 12. Wanted, Dead or Alive. Zevon's 1969 debut album is a mess. Weak songwriting backed up by confused and in places amateurish production. Depending on who you believe, producer Kim Fowley gave up on the project as a hopeless mess, citing that no one could work with Zevon. Or Zevon fired Fowley after what he described as a sudden attack of taste. Whatever the real story, this is a terrible record and not one that you need to hear. Number 11, My Rides Here. By 2001, something was clearly wrong with Zevon, but a lifelong dread of doctors kept him from having checked out. The malady metaphorically extended to the songwriting on this album, where only one song, the title track, could be considered a genuine Zevon classic, and too many are the semi-comedic character studies that too often pop up to mar his more introspective stretches. Number 10, Bad Luck Streak in Dancing School. I'm most likely missing something here, but why is it this album is so popular with fans when it has so many songs that have not much beyond a clever or failing cleverness wordy title? Gorilla You're a Desperado is a fan fave and does make some pointed observations about fame, aspiration and freedom through a jaundiced LAI. The line, most of all I'm sorry if I made you blue, but I'm betting the gorilla will too is a kiss-off worthy of Dylan's nastiness, but there are too many loud, repetitive variations on the theme of the headstrong rebel without applause, and too many failed music experiments. Dancing School is apparently an antiquated euphemism for whorehouse. So there you go, I learned something making this video. Number 9, Transverse City. Miraculously resurrected on a major, in 1987 through a deal with Virgin, Zevon promptly squandered the goodwill he built up with sentimental hygiene with the overblown concept album Transverse City. Jam-packed with odd bod guest stars, the record, which sounded great the first time you heard it, has lost its way due to two fates. Firstly, that it's full of pretty good songs that, had they not been bent to fit the narrative of albums, may have worked out in a more conventional sense, and the other one is simpler. There's just no reason to listen to this album. While it's too good to be truly awful, it's just not good enough to be actually interesting. I suspect the record is better than I rate it, and it has more fans than you might think, and I'd love someone to prove this theory right. Number 8, Mutineer, 1995. Welcome to Rock Bottom, Warren. Transverse City having flopped, he was dropped by Asylum, but almost immediately picked up by his good friend Irving Azov's new label, Giant Records. The first album he delivered, Mr. Bad Example, did well enough, but four years later his second, Mutineer, arrived just as the label was going out of business, and remains, along with Transverse City, perhaps his least familiar work. Which is a pity, because it contains some of his most finely sketched songs and tender-hearted hellfire. It's a solid rather than spectacular set of songs. Zevon gave up trying to be a craftsman in 1976, so his chief aim is to rub as raw as he can with the songs, and he does it relentlessly here. Number 7, Excitable Boy. Any album that features his only hit single and the all-time classic Accidentally Like a Martyr, the only song of his classic 70s compositions not associated with another artist, should be higher than 7th out of 12. But here's the problem. You can fire a shotgun at side two of the record and not hit a decent song. Album opener Johnny Strikes Up The Band is a busy work song, although I have also been told that it's a oblique metaphor about a drug dealer. 
and his business. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure of that. The title track seems pointless. It's not fun. It's not shocking. It's just crass for the sake of it. And Roland the Headless Thompson Gunner is a good sing-along, but it's a tiresome currency when you sit it next to a real song, such as Accidentally Like a Martyr. It shows where Zevon's strengths and weaknesses truly lie. Another issue is that Zevon has only one conception of how to rock, stiffly, with pounding drums and loud guitars. Much like Aretha Franklin, and here's an analogy you won't often hear, divorcing Zevon from his piano denudes his music and he loses all his sense of swing. But by golly, accidentally, like a martyr is a good song. Number six, The Envoy. Wildly uneven, 1982's The Envoy is where Zevon's musical House of Cards was complete and his personal house of cards came crashing down. Songs like The Overdraft apply the rock-hard, pound-hard formula brilliantly. Zevon sounds convincing as a rocker. Looking for the next best thing is a curmudgeonly love song, and The Hula Hula Boys is a deft character sketch with far better developed characters rather than comic book tropes. His remembrance of Elvis, Jesus mentioned, is also particularly moving. On the other hand, Ain't That Pretty At All is a mess and the title track displays a disturbing lack of knowledge about Middle Eastern geography. Number 5. Life Will Kill Ya Zevon's back, proclaimed no one in particular to even fewer people in particular, but to the hardcore cult indeed he was with a stonkingly good album put out on the bottom of the barrel Artemis records. Sharp, uncluttered production, some in-the-pocket drumming from the wonderful Winston Watson on songs where Zevon turns his sharp lens inward without turning himself into one of his own grotesque characters. A very worthwhile addition to any collection. Number four, Mr. Bad Example, or How Not to Become Rich and Famous in the Music Business. The disappointment was a virgin behind him, safely ensconced on his good friend Irving Azov's giant records for the time being. Zevon went back to pleasing himself and set a template for the remainder of his career. Hard rockers about life's losers mixed in with unexpected and occasionally discomforting meditations on his own existence, showing Rock's greatest curmudgeon to be a man of true humour and, if slightly beat up, heart. For every Bitter kiss off such as finishing touches, there's looking for a heart. For every grim observation of a price to pay in Renegade, there's a litany of brilliantly bad life choices made by Mr. Bad Example. Waddy Orchell provides an assured production which begins to nudge Zevon away from the preconceptions people may have formed about his music, and his usual cast of LA cutthroats work with and through him, not over him. Number three, the wind. There's a train leaving nightly called when all is said and done. Guys like me who are prone to be sentimental and feel the fleeting of their manhood's myth shouldn't listen to Warren Zevon. He knows too many improbable truths and saw into too many of our self-spun lies. Here he proves himself a masterful curmudgeon, a wry and sensitive writer and a rough but pleasing poet. There are some good songs, some incomprehensible songs, some songs that sounded rushed as the days got dim, but all up it's the sound of a man going out on his own terms, surrounded by friends. It's a damn shame he's gone. 2. Warren Zevon Already a 10-year veteran by 1976, Zevon was adopted by the LA Mellow Rock Mafia after being introduced to them by his roomies, Lindsay Buckingham before he got handsome, and Stevie Nicks before whatever the hell happened to her, and his newfound friend Jackson Brown, and more importantly, his best client in Linda Ronstadt. Soon he was hanging and drinking with all the cool kids, but he wasn't one of them. In a town where the closest thing to a cynic was Don Henley, Zevon was a nitric acid martini, a darkly mocking observer, a bilious haruspex presiding over the sacrificial lambs of L.A. The album is full of classics and the quibbles are nugatory. Poor, poor, pitiful me could have been moved to the top of side B and Muhammad's radio could take its place, 
and the French inhaler and his masterpiece, Hasten Down the Wind, could close out side A. All of this galumphry aside, this record is an absolute must to have for anyone who wants a rounded picture of the music scene in the 1970s. Number one, Sentimental Hygiene. Using a still underground REM as his house band and newly sober, Zevon summons up all his powers to cast his eye over his life and times, current and recent. Love is still a coin toss as the title track, The Heartache and Reconsider Me would suggest, but he's still an arch cynic with even a dog can shake hands pillorying the music business and Detox Mansion crucifying its byproducts. He's still proudly trouble waiting to happen and he doesn't trust fame enough to believe that we're all waiting for him to fall, as in the metaphorical Boom Boom Mancini. Only Leave My Monkey Alone seems forced, which might be why it runs out at the end of the album. But guess what? It was a hit of sorts. So what, perhaps, did I know? Warren Zevon was diagnosed with mesothelioma in 2002 and given a mere handful of months to live. In typically recalcitrant fashion, he vowed to live to see the release of the next James Bond film. Unfortunately for Zevon, this was Die Another Day. On his last appearance on his great friend David Letterman's show in October 2002, Letterman asked Zevon was he now aware, through his diagnosis, of anything that he might know about life and death that Letterman wouldn't. Zevon's answer was, not unless I know how much you're supposed to enjoy every sandwich. Warren Zevon passed away on the 7th of September 2003, two weeks after the release of his final album, The Wind. <laughs> 